comedian Russell Brand sat down with Tucker Carlson to discuss what he has faced in the mainstream media in the past year, which to Russell has included cancellation and what he describes as defamation. And he weighs in on the media's alleged attempts to silent independent voices. I recognize that the new emergent media spaces present a lot of possibilities, even with your kind compliments about our reporting on the Ukraine. All we've essentially done is listen to brilliant academics talking about the history of NATO and the coup in 2014 in Ukraine and Putin's explicit declaration that he would prefer, let's put it mildly, that Ukraine were not invited into NATO, that some of the regional disputes, how they're escalating tensions. This is information that because of independent media is available and perhaps the function that we, our media organisation, have fulfilled has been to collate that information and convey it directly in an accessible manner to give people an alternative perspective than to the homogenized mainstream opinion, yes. which amounts to, I've learned over the last few years, the amplification and normalization of the agenda of the powerful, that no opinions can be allowed into that space. And I'm astonished by how jealously it is guarded. There are points in my life where my personal self-regard would have loved the idea that I would be considered important enough to attack on this scale, to spend this amount of revenue and resources Sources on, but I'm now seeing that independent media itself is an extraordinary threat. The independent media inevitably leads to independent politics and independent thought. Uh, here's a little bit more from Brand on the legacy media significant attempts to control the information space that are so rigorously adhered to and protected that even what you might imagine to be a marginal voice is considered a significant enough threat to warrant coordinated media attacks, expenditure on peculiar clandestine non-government organisations and think tanks that take their money from the military industrial complex from the legacy media, who by the way, when they're critiquing independent media, they got skin in the game. They're not able to independently assess your work or my work or the medical opinions of Joe Rogan. They have a vested interest in destroying those organizations. It explicitly states on the Trusted News Initiative website, we are no longer in competition with one another. We have to curtail and stamp out. I think it even uses the word choke independent media. And it's clear that there are now sets of globalist organizations funded by government, but also corporations that are making deliberate, profound attempts to shut down any dissent in an astonishingly aggressive way. And to be sort of caught up in it is uh, terrifying on one level, absolutely terrifying, particularly due to the nature of allegations that I faced, but also revealing, more importantly, it's revealing about the way, the, the way that I believe the world and in particular this space will be affected and the way these events will continue to unfold in the coming years. So Brand uh, makes a number of, I think, very accurate um, evaluations of the shape of the media landscape and the alternative media landscape. And it's a reminder of the importance of doing, in the, in the alternative media landscape environment, of doing original reporting. And uh, so we can platform a lot of original reporting. We have you know, expert people come on. And then people who have thrived in this space, some of them themselves do a lot of great in-depth reporting, like Matt Taibbi and Michael Schellenberger. I think are doing some of the, the you know, best alternative alternative media work out there but they're you know they're getting scoops they're they're looking for original documents they're doing things like that um, just you know just having a you know a show like like ours and just reacting all the time you know to things people are saying can have I, I think it, it has some value because we have a tremendous audience we have very loyal viewers they can share those segments but it, it, what I was hearing from him earlier on was a, a call to do more original work so we both started doing more uh, more of our radars again more monologues again which a little have a little bit more of our their opinion and analysis but are a little bit more in depth we do a lot more in-depth research to make them um, to, to to bulk them up make them a little bit stand out more than our normal segments. And I think that's very good and very necessary so we don't just become an echo chamber uh, un unto ourselves because we lack some of the resources of, I mean, I'm saying this as we're attached to a, a perfectly mainstream large media organization, um, but uh, but media organizations that are in the mainstream have the have entire newsrooms and everything working to do often very good reporting. I'm not throwing it under the bus at all, um, especially not the work our organization does. They do tremendous political reporting um, and tremendous. They have actually very compelling uh, content on our sister TV channel, News Nation, which I'm increasingly a huge fan of. But 
the alternative media ecosystem needs to to platform more original reporting in addition to analysis is a long way of what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, look, the trends are clear. Fewer people are watching legacy media. More people are looking at media, uh, independent media. We, as we're talking, there's a congressional hearing going on uh, relating to social media use where there's a, a kind of a bipartisan consensus that's emerged that there's something dangerous about social media and alternative media um, efforts to ban TikTok that are very thinly uh, ideologically veiled. Um, apparently, right now, um, people are uh, at this hearing. I'm, I'm seeing uh, some critique of TikTok because people are talking more about Taylor Swift than Tiananmen Square. I don't know, like this idea that it's a it's a Chinese hoax because people aren't on TikTok. Mm -hmm. The kids the kids aren't talking enough about Tiananmen Square. Yeah, <laughs> Zuckerberg and uh, Linda Yaccarina are there too, <laughs> being uh, being grilled. So it's not even specifically TikTok, but I'm sure he's fielding a lot of questions. Right. I'm going to be. After we get done with the show today, I'm going to be processing the hearing, and I will likely have a radar on it tomorrow. Yeah, but that, that's all to say that that trend is happening, and I think it's ultimately for the good. But to your point, I don't think it's not just to say, oh, it's independent, so that it's good. There is a lot of independent media that is, you know, reaction-based content that isn't as substantive, that is, uh, you know, there are different incentives that exist online. There might not be that, it might not be that a, 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 a weapons manufacturer is running an ad on your program, and so therefore you're not going to be critical of a war the way it might be in the mainstream news. But it might be that you know that your audience has an appetite for um, certain, you know, salacious content or a certain kind of politics that you may or may not share, and there can be a kind of audience captures in that way. So there's risks to any media enterprise. What I think grounds news, what grounds real report, you know, good content is real reporting. So that's why I would say in particular, people like David Zerota and what he's been doing with The Lever are incredible because to do actual reporting, and I, and I, and I appreciate the Twitter files and what Matt Taibbi has done there, but that is still a, a kind of a, a bunch of documents that have been, you were granted access to because of um, respect that Elon Musk had for him as a journalist, which was well earned, and you know a kind of limited pool of documents and resources that came from one big disclosure, it takes an enormous amount of resources um, to be able to come up with scoops outside of the context of an individual relationship, and to have a diversity of news stories that you cover the way that someone like. Um, um, uh, Sirota has tried to set up at a lever, hiring staff members that can actually travel across the country and do follow-up reporting. The exposés he's been doing on Boeing, he, he regularly gets these scoops, his organization regularly gets these scoops that are just parroted and regurgitated out by the mainstream media. We had um, Max Blumenthal on yesterday talking about the work that he's been doing at Gray Zone and that the Electric and Infotata has been doing to try to dig into some of the reporting from the New York Times and other sources about the uh, October 7th allegations of sexual assault. And only now, because of his reporting, have other um, mainstream or mainstream outlets, The Intercept has done coverage on that now. And internally at the New York Times, as we reported yesterday, apparently they have even pulled one of their podcast episodes because of the questions that have been raised by independent reporting there. So it really, to me, all comes down to whether or not independent journalists are given the freedom to get to the root of facts. That's what should be driving all of this news right. coverage. And too much of what we're learning about what's happening at the mainstream, it's not just that I think that people are meandering away from it because they are not interested in whatever new show is being hosted by whatever old press secretary from the Biden administration or the Bush administration that's propped up over there. I say that as a, as a former press secretary myself. I feel like I can make that critique. Yeah. But because the journalism, the fundamental stories that they're covering and the facts they're deploying are so attenuated um, from the real facts on the ground, and it's, it's like 90% of their ideological priors, and you get the feeling that almost nothing that comes out uh, about what's going on in the world could affect the tone of how the coverage is being um, put, covered on, on those kind of channels. And I think that's the fundamental problem, and you get more of that authenticity in independent news. I should also note my colleagues at Reason, the magazine I also write for, who do a lot of foyering. and I have, a, I have yeah. a colleague there who actually just yesterday, I think he traveled 100 miles to go to a, a police headquarters to review documents that they then, for some reason, wouldn't let you take photos of, even though 
the poly, like you can look at you have to look at them and like memorize them and copy them by hand, but you can't just take a photo of it. It's those kinds of yeah. anti-transparency policies that exist. At the federal level, I'm sure, but oftentimes can be even more insidious at the local level where there's le less scrutiny and you can get away with that kind of thing. So there are good journalists out there doing good work, and we try to platform them and yeah. amplify their voices all the time, as do many others in this ecosystem whom we're paying close attention to. That does it for us for today. Tomorrow on Rising, we'll be here. Same bat time, same bat channel. Is that an old Batman reference? I think it might you're, be. You're the, the nerd in residence. Uh, they tell me yes. Uh, <laughs> Batman from the olden days. Well, that. <laughs> all right. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe, whether you're a Marvel or a DC fan, so you never miss any of this content. Content. And for those of you who prefer to listen while you're on the go or now available wherever you get your podcast. See you tomorrow to close out the week from us. And then there will be separate Rising Fridays content the day after that, if I have my days right. That's, Very bad at that's counting. right. You can never tell what day it is, can you? <laughs> it is a Wednesday. See you later. Bye-bye.